Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to our War in the Pacific series against XTRG. In today's episode, we are finishing up the month of January 1942, uh, at least from an orders perspective, and we're going to be seeing how much more the Japanese press in New Guinea. We'll see if they resume the press on New Caledonia, uh, where last turn they took a little bit of a breather and decided to launch artillery bombardments against our troops there. And we'll see what all happens in the Dutch East Indies, now that the Japanese are clearly driving on celebs. Uh, meanwhile, we've got an anti-submarine warfare attack here by the light cruiser De Reuter, the destroyers uh, Piet Han, and the Thracian against the Japanese I-153, uh, but they do nothing. It's deep water, they're Dutch destroyers, they're not British, and so they don't do that great of a job. Meanwhile, an American submarine launching torpedoes against a Japanese troop transport, uh, the Hisumi Maru. It got a hit, but ladies and gentlemen, the Mark 14 for you. Hit, but no explosion. That is the epitaph on the U.S. submarine fleet in 1941, 42, and 43. Okay, so we'll see what else happens here. We've got some Japanese destroyers attacking the USS Narwhal off the coast of Buna. Um... Yeah, so some depth charging going on here of the American uh, sub in this vicinity. Our sub is there trying to uh, intercept uh, the Japanese uh, destroyers, or actually, sorry, the landing forces. Japanese put a whole division ashore, and while generally attacking enemy ships in port hexes is not the wisest idea, uh, you can see there's two troop transports there, three cargo ships. We were hoping to sneak the narwhal in there and maybe get a good torpedo shot off. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Took four hits. It said one of them did hit it, so we'll have to take a look at the Narwhal and see how she's doing after this turn. I'm a little bit worried um, that she may suffer from some serious damage. Meanwhile, some Japanese heavy cruisers are bombarding Mascar, so they took Kendari a couple turns ago, and now they're bombarding Mascar on the western coast of Celebs, which we assume means the Japanese invasion is progressing further toward Sorobaya, and the other Dutch East Indies. You can see here a couple of heavy cru well, at least one heavy cruiser, two light cruisers, troop transport and a destroyer. The Japanese uh, inflict 163 casualties on the defenders there, uh, and now the Japanese are unloading troops over the beaches. Nothing like yesterday where they lost over 300 men as casualties, but they still lose 57 casualties and three squads destroyed, uh, as well as three non-combatants. So they lose something, I guess. That's a positive. Uh, as we're about to end the month of January and move into the month of February. We've got one more combat resolution in the month of January. That'll be tomorrow's, or the next, not tomorrow, but the next, the next turn, if you will. And then we'll be into February. Another 4th uh, Division Battalion? Is that the division that landed on the other part of Celebs? My guess is he probably stripped away a brigade or a battalion or something like that from the one invasion, because there's no reason the Japanese need to commit an entire division uh, to each any of these one bases. Meanwhile, some more bombardments here at Mascar, some more casualties on the Allied end. Okay... SS Sculpin is being attacked by Japanese destroyers here near Torohara. Go ahead and fast forward through this. Nothing much happens there. Another uh, anti-submarine warfare patrol is attacking the Sailfish, another American submarine, doing nothing there. And we're moving into the air operation phases. Hit but no explosion. Yes, that's the Mark 14 for you. I, wait, Tortuga's here? I didn't see Tortuga. I'm not Tortuga. Can I win my own bet? Alright. Air mission's being cancelled over Clark Field due to bad weather, so perhaps it gives Batan a bit of a breather with no air raids against it. Meanwhile, no break for the weary on Wen Kao. 40 Japanese KI-212 Sallies coming in here to bomb the troops there. They inflict 15 casualties on some non-combatant squads. They do lose one bomber damaged. A second raid here incoming of 17 KI-21 Sallies. Also hitting the troops there and doing no damage, but also losing one bomber damaged. Meanwhile, a massive fighter sweep over Singapore, or actually a bomber raid, 
uh, 52 Ki 27B Nates bombing, 7 Ki 48B1B Lilies, and 50 or 19 Ki 51 Sonya dive bombers uh, bombing there. Looks like we got ooh a couple of destroyed planes here by Flak. Flak scoring a couple of uh, victories there against a Sonya and against a Lily. Two Sonyas also damaged and one Lily damaged. Five runway hits, one airbase hit there at Singapore. We didn't put up any cap because we wanted to avoid running into 60-plus Japanese Zeros, or in this case, 50-plus Japanese Nates. Three more Japanese Zeros flying over Singapore. And then some Tojos there. Interestingly enough, the bombing raids at Singapore didn't appear to damage any aircraft on the ground. We don't have any active aircraft. Remember, we pulled all of our fighters out last turn, uh, or at least all the ones that could fly. But we do have about 30 damaged aircraft still on the ground there. Meanwhile, a second raid coming in here with some lilies. Uh, the lilies are running into some pretty stiff flak. You see several aircraft there being damaged by flak. They're getting a couple of runway hits, but we're not seeing any reports of destroyed aircraft on the ground. Meanwhile, there, another Ki-48 goes up in smoke. I'm curious if XTRG's industry is still producing lilies, because we've seen quite a few lilies, and it makes me wonder if he's replaced some Sally squadrons with lilies due to the massive casualties he suffered near Singapore. But the lily, I believe, is the older version of the Japanese uh, Army's bomber. The Sally is the more modern version. Again, he lost over 120 or 150 or maybe even 200 uh, lilies over Singapore over the course of about a week earlier in the war. Um, and so perhaps he had to replace them with some of his older aircraft. But I do wonder if he's actually building any new lilies or not. They are two engined aircraft, so one aircraft destroyed there does actually equal two victory points for yours truly. Meanwhile, we've got two PBY-4B Catalinas coming in here on a Japanese light cargo ship, and nice! We got a hit! A hit! The AKL Koshamaru takes a 500-pound bomb hit, two 500-pound bomb hits from these PBY-4 Catalinas. I think we had them flying out of Ambion uh, in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, we did see that the Japanese were uh, had a lot of task forces moving through the Dutch East Indies, and as a result, we ordered basically all of our uh, our uh, level bombers and all of our patrol aircraft to both search but also to attack. I realize if we run into a carrier group, that means we're going to take huge casualties, but I did want to try and do some damage to the Japanese uh, shipping moving through the area. He hasn't done much to try and reduce our airfields in the area, so we might as well try and reduce uh, at least some of his shipping there, and you can see two bomb hits on the Koshima 192 Japanese casualties. The Koshimaru appears to be transporting some non-combatants. That's a pretty big hit for the Japanese if eight squads are destroyed, potentially all 13 if the ship goes down. Uh, that might be 21 victory points for us, plus whatever the ship is worth. Um, we've got three uh, 193 WH-3s coming in here against the uh, cargo ship Shinji Maru. And nice! We got a bomb hit from them as well. So I did order these guys to come in at below 5,000 feet. You can see there they came in at 4,000 feet. And these Dutch bombers took one damage, but they did drop a successful bomb hit on the Shinji Maru. Seven Japanese casualties, a non-combatant squad destroyed. Uh, that is a very good result. Uh, naval attack. Each one of those bombers was carrying 300 kilogram SAP bombs. And uh, as a result, uh, we were able to successfully uh, land a bomb on the Japanese. So obviously, you know, the Dutch bombers tend to do absolutely nothing against um, enemy, enemy surface vessels. But the fact is that the fact that we dropped them down to a lower altitude gave them a better chance of hitting their target. And in this case, the American PBYs and now the Dutch bombers did their job putting bombs into enemy vessels. This is a larger cargo ship. The Shinji Maru is an AK, not an AKL. The AKL could sink. Two 500-pound bombs and an AKL, that's like a 3,000-ton ship. Very well could cause it to go to the bottom. I doubt the Shinji Maru will go to the bottom, uh, but... It does say heavy fires, so that's a good result for us. Maybe it will be a little bit of a pinprick and damage some uh, important units of his. Uh, maybe not. We don't know. They came in at 1,000 feet, by the way. Also, thank you, uh, Kriegs Maroon and Tack Error for the follows and joining the uh, channel. I know, Sean, right? I hit an enemy, pl or an enemy ship with a level bombing. That is absolutely a shocker. His troops are eating Wheaties. I don't know what that means, but okay. <laughs> um, 
Okay. So meanwhile, we had some Dutch uh, 193 WH3s coming in here toward uh, Johar Baru, ordered to attack the Japanese troops there. Uh, it does look like the Japanese combat air patrol of uh, Nates intercepted them. Damaged five, didn't shoot any down. We did drop our payload, but we didn't do any damage. Okay, second RTA division. So our recon is telling us that's a, that's a Royal Thai division just to the east of Pegu. Which means it's attackable, I think. Honestly, J Street, I don't remember the phrase, they must be eating their Wheaties. Wheaties is the breakfast of champions, right? So if it's the breakfast of champions, why are they eating their Wheaties if they're getting killed? If they're eating Wheaties, they should be doing well, right? We see bad air, canceled air operations over, or sorry, bad weather, canceled air operations over Clark Field uh, in the PM phase as well. So hopefully, again, that gives our soldiers in the area a bit of a reprieve. Fighter sweeps uh, north of Changsha at that airfield where we had our, uh, I think, the Flying Tigers based out of. Uh, 43 KI-21 Sally 1Cs, so not the 2A, but the 1Cs are coming in. Dropping payloads here. Two Sally's damaged by flak, one destroyed. We lose four H-81A3s, or damage on the ground, one destroyed. So if you remember, we pulled out like the seven operational planes left in the Flying Tigers. Uh, we have like 20 non-operational aircraft on the ground there. But at least the good news with that is that uh, pilots almost never get killed. If their planes are destroyed on the ground, the pilots are almost always safe. Probably in an air raid shelter somewhere. Uh, whereas if they get destroyed in the air, they're pretty much always dead. Or at least, you know, wounded or something. Uh, so at least the fact that they're being damaged on the ground is a better result than otherwise. Meanwhile, you can see here we've got some uh, eight escorting fighters bringing in four Dutch DO-24K1s against the Japanese fleet at Mascar. You can see the Japanese are uh, intercepting our raid with 11 A6M20s, three A5M4 Claudes, and five KI-43 1B Oscars. So it stands to reason that he's got some Oscars at Kendari. It's the only base he could base them out of that would be in range. So it does appear that he has a fighter squadron of Oscars based out of Kendari. And then he's also still got the carriers in the vicinity. Maybe down here. Maybe this task force is the carriers. But we know he still has the carriers in the vicinity, judging by the fact that there's two carrier-capable squadrons and one land-based squadron that tells us... I mean, I guess he could have all three at Kendari, but our intelligence said there were only 15 fighters at Kendari. So if that's accurate, he's probably got the Oscars here and the other aircraft are forming some sort of long-range cap over uh, over the troop transports or over the uh, naval vessels uh, basing toward Mascar. So you can see this dogfight's not going very well. They already broke into the bomber formation. The demons, the buffaloes, the hawks, not doing a great job, unfortunately. Uh, we'll go ahead and fast forward through here. It doesn't look like they broke through the, uh, the combat air patrol. It's claiming we only lost one DO-24K uh, destroyed. The rest of the air... air the rest of the... Uh, formation must have turned back. No enemy aircraft destroyed, but at least it wasn't a disastrous failure. I mean, jumping out of a World War II era fighter uh, maybe being better than death, but also maybe also equaling death, right? The two are not mutually exclusive. Wait, Sean, the propeller's in front of the aircraft. Hopefully you're jumping backward. An S-41 is firing torpedoes at another Japanese cargo ship here near Manadao. Unfortunately, it's torpedoes missed. That really sucks, too, because those are the only good torpedoes we have around the S-boats. Uh, at least they didn't uh, successfully drop any depth charges on it. Meanwhile, the Narwhal is also is still being attacked by more Japanese anti-submarine Warfare vessels, at least we're causing them to use up some depth charges and some supply, perhaps. Couldn't, uh, fires out of control, AM Finch is sunk. Meanwhile, another hit but no explosion here on a large cargo ship here north of, uh, Hokodao, I believe it is. A Japanese cargo, ta or cargo, uh, convoy here. 
The SS Thresher, putting a torpedo into the side of a Japanese cargo ship and failing to do any damage. More troops unloading at Mascar. And... Japanese bombardment at Changsha. That's to be expected. We'll go ahead and fast forward through this. Well, yeah, the, on the bombers, often the cockpit was ahead of the propellers, but um, on the bombers, at least on like the B-17, didn't the uh, didn't the pilots usually jump out the bottom of the aircraft? Wasn't there like a little hatch down near the the pilot's feet or whatever, or somewhere in that vicinity? So they were jumping down. They wouldn't be jumping out the side. There's no canopy to pull back. I guess the P-38 would be the one that would be a little bit dicey, right? Because the cockpit, I think, is slightly ahead of the propellers. Uh, in that case. Meanwhile, the bombardment attack at Changsha, 38 Japanese casualties, 265 Chinese casualties. That bombardment didn't go over well. Japanese deliberate attack here at Wenkou here on the coast. Uh, the Japanese have finally decided that it, they are going to try and reduce this fortification here. They have three division or two divisions, the 22nd, 116th, and they have a mixed 13th Independent Brigade, as well as a mortar regiment and an engineer regiment, a pretty sizable Japanese force here. We have the 100th Chinese Infantry Corps, uh, the 14th Chinese Base Force. The rest of these troops are largely uh, meaningless. But you see, if we fast forward here, Japanese did reduce the defense fortifications down to level 1. It had been at level 2. Even with reducing the fortifications, though, one to two assault on, so the Japanese lose 2,005 casualties, 10 infantry squads destroyed, 87 disabled, one non-combatant destroyed, four disabled, one engineer destroyed, four, 24 disabled, one gun destroyed, 10 disabled. Our defenders lose five destroyed, 34 disabled, so actually our, uh, the end result means that uh, they've lost far more in terms of combat power than we have. The only question is, even though they've lost more than double our forces, actually four times our forces in this battle, if the reduction of the fortification uh, evens things up enough for them. Meanwhile, another Japanese deliberate attack at Puching. Our 21st Chinese Corps is kind of sort of trying to keep the supply route open toward Wenkou, but I think they actually the supply route is already closed. We're just trying to hold like cow, it's, or ping, whatever it's called. Is it pun? Pooching. We're just trying to hold it out as best we can. Two to one Japanese assault odds, but interestingly enough, not huge casualties. 48 Japanese casualties, 190 allied casualties, only one squad destroyed on either side. So, feels more like these units are skirmishing than anything. And another bombardment attack at Nomaya. So you can actually see some of the assault value is recovering from the Allied forces at Nomaya, now that they're no longer being shock attacked. Uh, the bombardment does reduce that quite a bit. We lose two more squads destroyed, uh, 12 casualties. Uh, but our assault value is creeping forward. The main thing, though, is I think it's pretty clear that the Japanese are going to recover better than we are. Um, so whenever he attacks at Nomaya again, I'm sure it will finally succeed after quite a while of our troops holding up a, a heroic defensive. Uh, meanwhile, the Japanese launch a deliberate attack at Manadao, and they succeed. You get the Banzai cheer. Uh, Manadao, the eastern tip of Celebs, has fallen. So the second of the three main bases. There are three main bases on the island of Celebs. You've got Manadao, you've got Kendari, and then you've got Mascar. They've taken Kendari, they just took Manadao, and now they have forces ashore at Mascar. These are the three large airfields on the island that will really help them shut down Borneo and the entire rest of the Dutch East Indies. Perhaps with the exception of Sumatra, uh, which is probably a little bit out of their reach. 871 Allied casualties, 17 squads destroyed on the infantry side, 69 combatants uh, destroyed, 6 engineers, 7 guns, 4 vehicles, 1 unit retreated, 1 destroyed. The Japanese lose only 64 men, and this is an example of what we can expect as the Japanese begin taking more bases in the DEI. They're going to start closing the victory point gap because they're going to get more and more battles like this when we get overrun and destroyed, and we lose a lot. Meanwhile, the Battle of Tavoy, uh, Japanese 6th Royal Thai Infantry Division is attacking here at Tavoy. You can see they have 137 assault value, and they did drive back the pesky base force unit there. Really not much in the way of troops there. 8 Japanese casualties, 296 allied casualties, mostly just support troops there. You can see 15 engineer squads destroyed. Meanwhile, the 4th uh, Infantry Division, Section A, uh, launch is, is bombarded by the defenders at Mascar, but the defenders actually lose more men 
than the uh, than the uh, sorry the attackers of the bombardment. The Dutch lose men. The Japanese don't lose anybody. Port Moresby expands fortifications to size three, and that indicates to us that all the land combat is done, and we were going to be moving into the uh, sort of orders phase uh, of this turn here in just a moment. We're going to be moving forward to January 31st of 1942, the final day of the second month of our war against XTRG. Sean, yes, the men at Nomaya are in fact zombies. They are undead soldiers that I have blessed with the cross of Christ, and they are fighting for the goodly cause. All right, so let's get into the Dutch heroes save. I've already issued most of my orders for this turn, and it's really more about just showing what I'm doing, what's occurred, and interacting with you, the followers. I said that in a sarcastic way. Didn't mean it that way. Interestingly enough, the force at Singapore has grown stronger. Before they were at about 1,000 assault value. They're up to 1,111. So the fact that he is not aggressively pushing us back at Singapore is playing into our hands as our troops are strengthening themselves after the Battle of Marising, where many of them uh, had suffered some pretty strong casualties because we had continually tried to push the Japanese into the sea at Marising, and we had failed, uh, where we had many troops there that were uh, suffering some pretty serious casualties, including the 22nd Australian Brigade, which still has 32 squads disabled. We now have 1,111 assault value. He hasn't actually started bombing the troops there, so that's good news. Meanwhile, we still have about 22 aircraft at Singapore, but they're not ready. They're not able to take off. These are damaged damaged airframes at the runways. There are no active airframes at Singapore. That's because I've been pulling the troops out. So we've got some of our aircraft at Sebang here on the north coast of Sumatra. You can see here we've got about nine aircraft, seven of them ready. Um, some two Hurricanes, two Flying Tigers, uh, two Singapore Recon aircraft, and two Buffaloes, three Buffaloes actually. We've also moved some aircraft here north to Port Blair, uh, which is an island between Rangoon and Sumatra kind of as a staging area. We've got fly five Flying Tigers there, one Buffalo there. So six aircraft at Port Blair. Uh, not a lot of supply at Port Blair, but we actually have 14, or sorry, eight aviation support. So that should be able to repair the one aircraft that's damaged, keep the other guys up and ready and flying, and get them to evacuate to Rangoon. Meanwhile, at Rangoon, we've got a lot of aircraft there in general, uh, but we are pulling out more or less all of our fighters, or a majority of our fighters, to Rangoon. We're up to 32 ready aircraft, 41 fighters uh, at Rangoon. Uh, of those fighters, 11, or sorry, 18 Buffaloes are already based there, so they're already there. The same for the Blenheim IFs, we've got eight of those. But otherwise, we've now pulled in some six P-40s from the American squadrons and nine Hurricanes uh, from the British squadrons that have evacuated so far out of Singapore. So that means that we have gotten about... 15 aircraft out of Singapore and into Rangoon, where they can hopefully give the Japanese a bloody nose uh, if they try and launch any bombing raids there. Uh, meanwhile, we've also pulled some of those aircraft back out to Surabaya, and I've actually concentrated a large number of aircraft here. We've got 54 fighters at Surabaya. Some of those are Dutch aircraft, like the CW-21B Demons, the 75A-7 Hawks. We've pulled those aircraft back out of Mascar to make sure that they don't get caught on the ground if the Japanese launch a successful attack there. But we've also moved some buffaloes of some the Royal Air Force there, about 11 buffaloes there. Uh, and we've moved the P-39 Aerocobras there. We've got 10 P-39 Aerocobras at Surabaya. We have detected the Japanese mini carrier battle group here with 46 fighters and 38 bombers and 16 auxiliary aircraft here moving west just on the southern tip of the island of Celebs. So obviously they're supporting the invasion here. That's why we saw these zeros and the cloths here operating at operating Mascar. They're moving west. I don't know how far west they're moving, but they're moving west somewhat. If they move west far enough, I'm going to issue bombing raids against them. I don't think they're going to accomplish much, but I will say my last turn's bombing raids did give me a little bit of encouragement. We have 44 medium bombers based out of Surabaya, and so we are going to be launching attacks. 
at low level with these Dutch 193 WH3s, these Hudsons, uh, and that's basically what we've got here. We've also got some L Lockheed 212s. I don't know if those are any good at anything, uh, but we've got about 44 ready aircraft ready to launch bombing raids against the Japanese. They will probably die, but the thought is that they will at least uh, cause XTRG to think twice about deploying his carriers so far forward when really the only thing he has so far is a handful of fighters based out of Kendari. He has no bombers in this entire region. And so if we can make him think twice about forward deploying his carriers, that's going to force him to slow down and rely more on land-based aircraft, which I am 100% in favor of if that is in fact the approach he adopts. Um, if it's not, then maybe we'll get lucky and we'll place a bomb on one of his carriers. We've also issued the 15 patrol aircraft here to continue to patrol, but also to attempt to bomb uh, the Japanese at uh, in, in the region as well. Do I have an air HQ? Ooh, I do. I've got some Catalinas flying out of here, so I'm actually going to go ahead and issue some orders to uh, build up some ordnance stockpiles. Now, we are using 200 supply every time we do this, but I'd like to, you know, I guess we'll use 2,000 supply to build up a torpedo ordinance here of uh, 100 torpedoes uh, out of uh, Sorbaya, which should actually now give our Catalinas here some torpedo ordinance, I think. I guess those don't have torpedo ordinance. These guys only carry bombs. Some of them carry torpedoes, right? None of them? None of these guys carry torpedoes. Some of the aircraft have to carry torpedoes, right? All right, so these guys do. The U.S. Navy ones carry torpedoes. Whoops. So they're going to have torpedoes to draw from. Um, I think that's the only squadron, the VP-101s. There's got to be someone else who has torpedoes in the region. Uh, do these guys use torpedoes? No, they don't. Still, I guess we'll pull them back. Uh, naval strike. Okay. Meanwhile, I guess we could try and move our Vildebeests up there. I don't know if they can get there. Can they get there in time? No. I'm going to order my Vildebeests to get into the vicinity. I have no air capacity there. We're going to move them to Copang. We're going to have them stand down. I'm not going to order them to attack yet because there's no torpedoes at Copang. But we're going to have our Vildebeest move to Sorbaya as well. Because, hey, if we're going to put together a big defensive there and we have torpedoes, because I guess I totally missed the fact that we have an air, air HQ there, that can use torpedoes. If I can get 20, uh, you know, 20 dive bombers or 20... Um, uh, biplanes into the Dutch East Indies, into Java here, armed with torpedoes, and we've got some 50 to 60 fighters that can maybe escort them in, uh, then perhaps it's worthwhile uh, giving them orders to, you know, to try and strike at the enemy. I don't think it's any risk of being actually bombed by the Japanese. I don't even think they're going to be in range of Sorabaya, but if they do make that bold of a gambit, because XTRG has made some really bold gambits in the past, I do want to punish him. Okay, so that's the situation in the Dutch East Indies. Meanwhile, we're ordering our cruisers and our carriers to pull back to Perth, so they're going to move west a little bit. Uh, the carrier battle group as well is going to move a little bit west, and then they're going to move south. Um, there is a Japanese or submarine nearby, so hopefully they don't put a torpedo in Hermes. Uh, but we've got a fair number of destroyers escorting them as well, uh, so hopefully that's good enough. Uh, maybe we should just uh, doubly make sure, move them at flank speed for a couple of days, just to get them out of the range here and move them quickly enough. We can always reload fuel at uh, when, they, when we get to our destination. Meanwhile, we'll load these guys up. Uh, why are they not loading fuel? Loading supplies? What? It's a tanker. You're supposed to load fuel. What the fuck? All right, disband. Form a new task force. Form a tanker task force. Oh, Tijalap has no fuel. Well, that's probably why. We'll go ahead and disband that task force and keep him there for now. 
Meanwhile, we have a couple of tankers at Sorbaea, which I'm trying to get out of the way, just in the case that the Japanese carrier battle group does decide to do something. We're going to run these guys north to Oosthaven. Maybe that'll be enough to lure his carriers into range of Sorbaea. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but we are running our, our tankers out to Oosthaven to get them out of the immediate vicinity of the Japanese Kiributai and any land-based bombers he might base at Kendari. Meanwhile, at Oosthaven, we've got 16,000 fuel loaded up. This force uh, that has about up to 19,000 of, of fuel uh, that it can fit on board should probably depart Oosthaven uh, in the direction of Perth here uh, with about 19,000 fuel on board before too long. And as soon as they're done, we're going to start loading up 16,000 fuel on the two tankers that are already at Oosthaven. We've pulled almost all of the fuel out of Palembang here. There's only 5,000 fuel left at Palembang, although there is almost half a million oil. Uh, but we've got about 40,000 fuel at Oosthaven uh, that we can then put on, on some of those tankers as well as we continue our efforts to, to suck Sumatra dry or at least to limit the damage uh, that uh, we will suffer uh, as a result of XTRG taking the island, which he eventually will. Meanwhile, I have decided to pull our mine layers and our uh, harbor defense mine layers, or, or whatever you call those guys, out of Singapore. They actually have a level 8 uh, anti-submarine ability. So in very short-range situations, these guys are very good. They're as good as British destroyers against enemy submarines. And so if we base them at Pago Pago or at Suva, other places he's based his submarines out of, we could really do some damage to the Japanese subs. So I have decided to go ahead and try and save these guys. Uh, they don't have very long range. So the first destination that they're going to is Palembang. They're going to refuel at Palembang, uh, pull probably 500 fuel out of the base there. Then they're going to move to Batavia. And then from Batavia, we're going to try and island hop them south toward Australia in a MacArthur patrol boat-like manner. Although I know he did get on B-17s nonetheless. Whew. Uh, meanwhile, he wasn't running con cap over all the convoys. He was running cap over some of the convoys. Okay, so meanwhile, in terms of Pegu, uh, we have the 1st Burma Division. So you guys may remember I was trying to get a whole bunch of troops concentrated at Burma uh, to, lo to basically turn them in to the Burma Division. Off camera, I did rebuild the unit. So there were like three brigades that were all united. There was a couple of Indian brigades, a British brigade or battalion, a Burmese brigade, two Burmese brigades, I think it was, one Indian brigade and a British infantry battalion that were all able to be formed into the Burma Brigade or Burma Division, the first Burma Division, assault value of over 300. We're also going to be having the 48th Gurkha Brigade and the 16th Indian Brigade, as well as the BFF Brigade and the 4th Burma Rifles all moving south, uh, or sorry, east, to deal with the 2nd Royal Thai Army Division, which our recon has spotted here. The Royal Thai Army Divisions usually have around 160 assault value. We're going to be coming at them with closer to 500. Uh, the only problem is we're going to be on the offensive. They're going to be on the defensive. The terrain will favor them, but the thing is they're not Japanese infantry. They're Royal Thai infantry, which don't perform as well. They might actually even be militia. So the fact that we're coming at them with an organized division, some Gurkhas, an Indian Brigade, BFF Brigade, which is some uh, Burmese squads, uh, and then um, uh, a Burma Rifles Battalion, hopefully that's enough so that we can win a really decisive victory and shatter this division and then potentially throw him a little bit off balance in Burma because we've seen he's moved a Royal Thai division to Tavoy and he's just driven back our uh, 100 and whatever base force, uh, which was at Tavoy. They're not going to fall back to Mug Mergi. Uh, and then he's also got some other forces here that are moving toward Tavoy as well. So if we can defeat this division here, that'll be great. Maybe it'll make XTRG think twice. Maybe it'll put, make him peel some units away from Singapore. That's probably unlikely, but it's a possibility nonetheless. The lack of air raids over Burma, meanwhile, resulted, or sorry, over Bataan, means that we only spent 100 supply last turn at the uh, base of Bataan, which is good for us. Still have over 40,000 supply, 40,365. We had 40,400 last turn. Um, I had made some comments about us using up our uh, supply there at an alarming rate. Someone suggested to me that I turn off my anti-aircraft units uh, from firing against enemy bombing raids, but there apparently is no rest or training option for units when an enemy infantry unit is in their hex. So I don't think we can do anything there other than allow them to continue to shoot at Japanese bombers when they do come by. So 
I guess the one good thing is we reported like 15 enemy aircraft damaged. Uh, so maybe that'll continue. Meanwhile, uh, what else is going on? I'm trying to think. Port Moresby built its defense level up to the next uh, fortification level. So fortification level 3 with 184 garrison uh, in defense. Uh, we've also got this uh, rifle company that's on the way to support. We've got actually three rifle companies on the way to support Port Moresby. Um, how is the narwhal, by the way? She took some damage. Not a ton. Uh, 11 system damage, 9 float damage. I guess we'll go ahead and we'll pull her back uh, to Townsville. That's probably enough warranted to, to return to repair, but it's nothing that the ship is in danger or anything like that. Um, we've got a couple of task forces here, maybe even the Kidu Butai here based out of Rabal. Uh, CVL and CVs located at Rabal. Um, and then we've also got some destroyers here based out of Rabal potentially um, in the Solomon Sea. Nomaya, meanwhile, has built its defenses back up to level 5 assault value for the garrison there. Um, a good deal of them are the Free French Soldiers, uh, the New Caledonia de Detachment, and the 4th Australian Battalion uh, of Troops. And they're doing okay. They're, I mean, not really. They're, they're not really doing okay. But they're hanging in there, guys. They're hanging in there. And that's about all I have to say for that. Um, cruisers and destroyers here. These guys just replenished, I believe. And so we're going to go ahead and send them into uh, Auckland here. I think we'll go ahead and uh, order some of these guys to repair. I think our, well, actually, we're using 15,000 tons in our repair shipyard as it is right now. We probably should pull the uh, Minnesota out and repair her. She's going to take, uh, oh, wow, more days if we send her to critical than if we don't. But we'll send her into the shipyard at normal. She'll use up 10 days there. So about two weeks for the Minnesota to get back in action. Meanwhile, we'll also send the Pensacola into the repair, the dockyards as well. It's going to send us well over the uh, the minimum shipyard threshold here. 34,000 tons of shipping versus shipyard capable of only repairing up to 15,000 tons. The good news is the New, the New Orleans here should finish up tomorrow, and that'll free up about 10,000 tons of uh, repairs that are going to be done. Uh, we, we do need to send the New Orleans somewhere else to rearm, though. Unfortunately, Auckland is not a large enough port to rearm uh, these uh, these cruisers. I think we're in the process of, of building Auckland up to a level 6 port, which might be big enough. Either 6 or 7 is big enough. No, we're not in the process of expanding it. So we should expand Auckland to a level 6 port. It's already a level 6 airfield. Fortifications are already level 3 as well. Um, we've got various convoys and task forces moving around here. We're going to be moving a engineer battalion the 34th combat uh, engineers are going to be moving to norfolk where they're going to build up some defenses here as sort of a buffer between nomaya which the japanese will eventually uh, take and uh, new zealand here uh, ensuring that we kind of protect our supply line here into australia uh, they won't be enough to prevent a substantial japanese attack but they will be enough to prevent a maybe half-hearted attack 10,000 fuel on that fleet oiler on the way into auckland uh, so that'll be uh, good there with the cruisers operating out of there. We've got some tankers returning home to port. Uh, I think our carriers around. Yep, carriers are just north of Bora Bora. Uh, you can see the Lexington, Saratoga, Yorktown, and Enterprise are all on the way. I have diverted them away from Auckland. So originally they were going to be going to Auckland. But the Japanese have had a fair amount of submarine activity in and around here. And I don't want them to spot my carriers. So instead I'm moving them to the south to Wellington, which is also a level 5 port as well. Uh, and uh, is connected via Auckland via our railway, so they'll be able to pull through any of the required fuel necessary to replenish the, kid, the uh, carrier battle group there, and then we can probably move them in and around to Australia. Um, I think we also have some fleet oilers on the way here uh, that are kind of following them, and we've diverted them to Wellington as well, some 20,000 fuel on these two fleet oilers with some destroyers uh, on their way up. And then we've got some other task forces and whatnot moving it around near Hawaii. Uh, not a lot of other task forces or actions going on. Our troops that are railing from the East Coast still haven't arrived at San Diego, unfortunately. We did get a transport convoy that arrived at Los Angeles here with some good transports. The President Fillmore, President Tyler, President Buchanan, and President Taylor. These are large, fast troop transports. Uh, good, well, I guess not that fast, 14 knots, but still decent sizes. They're going to be moving back to San Diego when these regiments arrive at San Diego for us to load them up and reinforce the South Pacific. When they eventually arrive, you can see that some of them are over here and, and whatnot. 
Uh, meanwhile, we did also form up those three Canadian rifle battalions that had been shipped into uh, Seattle, have now formed into the 13th Canadian uh, Brigade and Infantry Unit. They have 108 Canadian militia squads. They're supposed to have infantry sections, regular infantry sections, so I wonder if that'll get replaced eventually and turn them into a much better unit. But for the moment, they're going to be getting on trains and they're going to be going to San Diego as well uh, because they are assigned to the South Pacific. So we can go ahead and send them to some garrison uh, activities out there. No other real convoy duties in the eastern U.S. Uh, Colombo is actually, or sorry, Cape Town is actually entirely out of fuel. Uh, we have some uh, convoys that are on their way to give it about 80,000 fuel here, uh, but they're all still a little ways away. They're 20 days, 30 days, 27 days, 22 days away. Uh, fortunately, Cape Town does draw a little bit of fuel on its own, uh, but for the moment, uh, it is a little bit bare. We are running some convoys out of Aden here, or Abaddon here in the Middle East. Uh, we've got 3,200 fuel on this convoy, loading up some 30,000 fuel on this uh, tanker convoy, and we've already got 20,000 convoy on, or fuel on this cargo ship convoy, all headed toward Karachi, which currently is 91,000 fuel uh, and has a fair number of uh, units here based out of it. Uh, it is sort of the hub for everything coming from the Middle East into India because once that fuel gets into India here, uh, it can be shuttled around to the rest of the Indian subcontinent where it can go into factories and can be used to produce supply. Meanwhile, we've got a few units that are moving from India into Burma, but they're going to take a little while to get there. You can see we've also formed a, a defensive line on the Burma border just to make sure the Japanese can't invade India proper. We've already looked at Pegu. Uh, Rangoon, meanwhile, still has about 34,000 supply. Um, not a ton, but we've got a bunch of convoys that are on the way there. In China, we've got this large force here at Changsha, 5,300 assault value. I will start pulling them out as soon as it becomes apparent we can't hold any longer. But for the moment, the Japanese seem to be concentrating the vast majority of their forces here at Changsha, uh, which is, seems to be their, their primary point of effort. Um, they've got even more units that are on the way, apparently. Uh, the one interesting thing, though, is we have the 48th Chinese Corps, which has just gotten astride the Japanese uh, rail line here. So the Japanese did link up. So they took, if you remember back a little while uh, the, ago, the Japanese did take, uh, where is the city? They did take the city of Luoyang. They have taken this entire railway, which at the beginning of the game, there's Chinese troops all over here. Uh, but they have cleared this railway here between Xinjiang, Hankou, and um, Changchao. So they can just rail supplies down to Wuchang, which makes their advance on Changsha that much easier. Fortunately for us, we sent what little force there is in the 48th Chinese Infantry Corps here, three Chinese rifle squads, an anti-tank gun, uh, and some support units. Uh, not a very large number of men, about 600 men all told, are now sitting astride this railway here. So it is cutting the railway supply into Wuchang, uh, which is going to impact his ability to rapidly reinforce Changsha. Now, I think he's already moved the majority of his forces there, but nonetheless, it'll make their supply lines a little bit less efficient. He can move some supplies up the river, and it automatically does, but it does prevent any sort of rapid reinforcements of the uh, Chinese until he can clear this rail line or sorry, the Japanese, before he can clear this rail line, which I think is a good thing. Um, meanwhile, what did he reduce? He did, I'm trying to remember. Um, he reduced the fortifications down from two down to one. I think that was Wang Chao, uh, where you can see here, uh, fortification level one. The 100th Chinese Corps still has 341 assault value, so it's still doing relatively well from a unit perspective. The other units here, the 88th, the 86th, they're not in good shape at all. These guys are just, there aren't even any rifle squads here. They're just support units with a couple of 81 millimeter mortars. So some of these units are pretty battered, but no one's out of supply yet. Wang Kao's been reduced to a level one fort. Uh, I think it's trying to build back up. It is. Uh, but it's at 0%, so it's unlikely to get it back to level 2 at any time. Um, we're at 1,800 uh, assault value in Bataan, so that really hasn't changed. Meanwhile, the forces at Mascar, where he landed nearly a, a division there, or at least a segment of a division, only 40 assault value there between the Mascar garrison and the base force there. We continue to see a large number of Japanese shipping, so we mentioned the carriers here, but there's a large amount of shipping going into Kendari here. Uh, you can see more formations here moving east and west all over the Cream Sea. Um, more troops moving west here. 
We've got some units here moving northwest, some units moving east, potentially toward Namilia or, to, or toward Ambion. If he is sending troops toward Ambion, he'd be well advised to send a substantial force uh, because if we actually look at uh, Ambion, Ambion is one of the best defended locations in the entire Dutch East Indies. It's odd to say that. But Ambion has the 4th Coastal Gun Battalion, which consists of four 150mm coastal defense guns. These are big coastal defense guns. These are going to be good versus pretty much anything but maybe heavy cruisers and battleships. Granted, there's only four of them, but they're actually decent units here. Additionally, we sent the Sparrow Battalion out of Australia. It's part of the 8th Australian Infantry Division, uh, which has two brigades at Singapore. But we, spent this, we sent the Sparrow Battalion, 36 squads of Commonwealth regular infantry, four Bren sections, six combat infantry uh, uh, engineer units, uh, four Vickers sections, six anti-tank guns. He's going to need to send a reasonable force here toward Ambion to reduce it. And the good news is we've got over 5,000 supply there. Uh, in terms of the supply draw that these units actually uh, use, if we actually take a look here, they only require about 697. 5,261 is on the base. So we have 130 garrison here with some very good Australian troops backing up the garrison, some very good coastal defense guns. Ambion could be a little bit of a surprise if he only sends a light, you know, fast transport type task force here uh, to try and take the base. I don't know if we'll throw him into the sea, but he certainly won't take the base without probably, I would guess, he'll need to send a regiment there at least. So this will be kind of our own little Alamo here uh, to try and hold him off in the eastern Dutch East Indies. Um, okay. Sorry, guys. I haven't been keeping fully up with the chat. Not a lot else is changing here in Australia. Um, we've already looked at the carriers. And we've already looked at uh, the U.S. West Coast, or at least what there is to show there. I guess the one other thing to show is the uh, British carriers, uh, or the new carrier that's coming online. I don't even know where it is. Oh, it's down here. So we're sending this formation wide over to Perth, the carrier Indomit Indomitable. Uh, it has 12 Fulmer II fighters, 18 Albacore I torpedo bombers, and 9 Sea Hurricane fighters. Uh, 43 or 45 aircraft can be fit on the aircraft carrier. 33 are currently on the aircraft carrier, uh, and she's on her way to Perth. A wide berth, so I think it's unlikely that she runs into Japanese submarines, uh, but she does have three destroyers in support and a battleship also, uh, so she's on her way to Australia there. Um, we did also just this last turn uh, receive a new battleship here at San Francisco. The Idaho just arrived in theater. We're sending her to Pearl Harbor with two destroyers and escort. She can make 22 knots. She has uh, air search radar and uh, SGSSR S radar, which I'm assuming is surface search radar. I don't know what SG stands for, but nonetheless, New Mexico class battleship, 14 inch guns, nine of them. Uh, she's on her way to Pearl Harbor. Um, we also have uh, some other task forces that are already on their way to Pearl Harbor. Uh, we've got the War Spite, and I think it's the Colorado somewhere in there. There's still a little ways out right over here. Haven't detected any enemy submarines there yet, which is good, but we've got the Colorado, uh, which was upgraded recently to include surface search and air search radar. SC instead of SG, whatever the difference is. Uh, but the USS Colorado and the uh, Royal Navy HMS Warspite, uh, both on their way to Pearl Harbor. Uh, in addition to the Idaho, that'll be three battleships. And I think we currently have, do we have one active battleship at Pearl? So that'll give us four total. We have no active battleships at Pearl. We suffered some damage there. The Nevada will be ready in 12 days, though, so by the time both of those units arrive, uh, we'll actually have four battleships there. And the Oklahoma, which took a torpedo in our bombardment of Midway, uh, will be ready in about a month and a half. So five ready battleships inside less than two months, uh, in addition to the another year for the Tennessee and the California, which are both repairing from their damage at uh, Pearl. Now, uh, I didn't actually see either of the Japanese uh, ships that we bombed last turn get sunk. The only sh reported sinking was the Finch last turn. In terms of aircraft losses, last turn was actually a good turn for the Allies. Ten Japanese aircraft lost, only six Allied aircraft lost. He lost four Lilies, three to Flak, one to Operations. He lost two Babs, uh, both to Flak. Uh, we lost two DO-24K-1s, uh, the Dutch 
uh, sort of recon aircraft. He lost a Sonya, a Dini, a Sally, an Alf. We lost a Seagull, a Falcon, a Demon, and one of the Flying Tigers on the ground. We only lost one aircraft on the ground. So despite all those aircraft that he bombed north of Changsha with, uh, he didn't actually cripple our force there. If we actually go back to Changsha, uh, or sorry, if we go back to uh, Changthe, uh, we'll see here that we still have about 16 H-81 Flying Tigers on the ground damaged uh, that are not yet ready to come back into service. Uh, if we take a look at those, it looks like one of those may be ready tomorrow, depending on what happens with his bombing raids next turn. Uh, and then in the other task force, we've got three ready. So if everything goes well, we might be able to pull four more back out to Chungking. We've pulled the other the elements that can fly back to Chungking, which equals about nine uh, planes. Uh, and so, obviously, that's not a huge number, but it uh, it's it's something. It's it's enough of the formations to survive uh, any disaster. Um, and that's the situation right now, guys. I don't have a lot else going on. Don't have a lot else to say. I've been converging some submarines on the Japanese carriers over here. Uh, but um, other than that, uh, I guess at this point... Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up from a YouTube perspective. Uh, stick around on the, the stream, guys. I'll talk to you and answer some questions that you might have. Uh, but at least for the YouTube video, guys, I will uh, wrap this up by saying thank you once again uh, for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.